the, the cornerstone of the talk will be on surgery for prostate cancer, but I think what I would also focus on as well is sort of what are some of the recent government sort of decisions that have been made that impact some of the things we do in prostate cancer? How has that impacted treatment? And how has the urologic community responded to those in altering its paradigm of, of prostate cancer treatment? So I think the real question is, you know, everyone hears about active surveillance and watchful waiting and a whole slew of different uh, radiation therapies. Is there even still a role of surgery or for surgery in prostate cancer? And just to take us back, many of you probably heard, this has made the lay press quite a lot, is something called the PLCO study, and that stands for prostate, lung, colon, and ovary. And this was a massive screening trial that started a long time ago, back in the late 80s, to look at these four cancers and see if screening is beneficial in all these things. And so the prostate study um, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2009, and it found that there was no benefit to screening for prostate cancer in U.S. men. And this is the study here. You see the screening arm and the control arm. There was no statistical difference in overall survival. And so the, as a result of this study, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, which is the major arm of the U.S. government that comes out with their public health recommendations, said, well, let's look at this data and see whether we should recommend or not recommend screening. So the U.S. government said, well, you know, our study was not in favor of, of screening, so we're going to give it a recommendation of D, okay? And back in 2009, the U.S. government said, we are not going to recommend prostate cancer screening. And, and, and I'll show you in a moment what happened to the medical community as a result of that. And But what's really important, and, and I have to give credit to this, what the next few slides, is one of our residents... His name's Yoni Shoag, really smart guy, went to Harvard Medical School, and he came, he's now doing his training with us here at Cornell. Went back during his research year and looked at the data, the raw data from the PLCO, and I'm going to show you, is really interesting. So if you look at the, the graph here, as I mentioned, the study was initially designed back in the 1980s when PSA screening was not very common. In fact, PSA screening really didn't, or PSA test, didn't come into play until 1989. So when they were first designing this study, you can see the number of men that actually had PSA screening was less than 20%. Very few men ever had a PSA test. So they said, okay, well, this is great. Let's begin to compare those men who were screened and those men who weren't screened. But then when they started the trial back in 1993, you could see screening rates were as high as 60%, right? So now you're seeing it, it's, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to compare apples to oranges, right? Because you really want to take a group that was never been screened and compare it to a group that has been screened. But now you're seeing that 60% of the population have already been screened, that's becoming more difficult. So what happened, the, the way they did, they handed out a questionnaire to all the patients in the trial. And this is the questionnaire, and this is how they determined who were screened and who were not screened. And basically what they said, if you had a, ever had a PSA blood test for prostate cancer, if the answer is yes, obviously that means you were screened before. But if you look at the next question, when did you have your most recent PSA blood test for prostate cancer? So they only included men who were screened within the last year. So all of these men who had PSA screening but more than a year ago were considered never to have been screened, okay? And then what was the main reason you had the PSA test? And they only included men if it was part of a routine physical. So if they went to a doctor and had a PSA done for some other reason, they weren't considered screened. So all of a sudden, the light bulb went off in our resident's mind and Yoni's head said, well, wait a minute, this is crazy. If we actually look at all the men who were screened, okay, you really find something very interesting. And this is the graph that shows that. So you see here, as the, you, this is when the study started up through 12 years. And you see, by the end of the study, 91% of men were actually screened. So the original published study is comparing screened men to screened men, right? So of course, you're never going to find a difference in survival 
when you're comparing two of the same groups. So Yoni, being the smart resident that he is, went ahead and published this in the New England Journal of Medicine, okay? And as a result, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, the U.S. government changed their recommendation to a C. So this is a really amazing example of how a young student can come up, reevaluate the raw data of a trial, and the U.S. government, where all insurance carriers, you know, by the way, go by the U.S. government's recommendation. So the U.S. government initially said, no, we don't recommend it. Now they recommend screening, and here's the true recommendation. So in men who are between 55 and 70, they recommend that screening should be discussed with them. If the patient doesn't want it, that's fine, but it should be discussed. And they still say that men over 70 should not be screened for PSA. So it's an improvement. It's not perfect, but it's a big improvement in now. And, and so what's really interesting is if we look at the trends here. So if you look on the upper left column here, this looks at you know, back in 2008, they first came up against screening in men over 75, and then in 2012 was the study I just showed you, and you can see how screening goes down in both populations of men. So the medical community listens to this. Primary care doctors follow these recommendations, and you see screenings going down, and you can see it's even going down, what's really concerning, in this young population of men between 40 and 50, these are the people in the primes of life who really should be screened, we're seeing screening dropped significantly. So it's not like these recommendations go unheeded and not listened to. The, the medical community does listen to these. Yes? So question, um, was this the exclusive reason that they changed their rating? I think it was the main reason. I think there was a variety of different reasons, but this, the, the data that, that this institution here, Cornell published in New England Journal of Medicine, was the, the biggest sort of impetus behind them changing their recommendation. Because I never heard of that. Yeah. It's really, it's amazing. I mean, it's an amazing it story. And this was given as a big plenary talk at the AUA, not last year in Boston, but the one before that, I think it was in San Francisco. So were you one of the co-authors of it? Yes, it's, it's an interesting study, but Yoni was the real brainchild behind this. It wasn't anyone else. It was really amazing. He was truly the brainchild behind this. So if we go on, what's really concerning to me, you know, African-American men have the highest rates of prostate cancer. And so no, very few people, I should say, argue that if you're going to screen patients, the first group you start with are high-risk populations, right? Because these are the ones who you really can save lives. But unfortunately, what was happening, even in African-American men, screening rates were going down. So these were concerning trends, and everyone was worried that we were going to re-enter the era of the late 80s when we would only diagnose prostate cancer when it was metastatic. We would never diagnose it at a point when it's curable. So how did the urologic community respond to this? So, I, you know, look, I don't want to paint a picture that this was all bad, because I think prostate cancer was being overdiagnosed was being overtreated, and there's, you know, there's huge quality of life side effects to overtreat prostate cancer, as you all probably well know. So I think there was some good that came out of these restrictions on screening. And I think the first thing that came out is, as a community, we began to risk stratify screening programs. So yes, does, does every single individual need to get screened? And the answer is probably no. When someone who's 72 years old that has no family history of prostate cancer and has had normal PSAs their whole life, they probably don't need to have PSAs checked anymore. Um, but, but we certainly need to stratify two risk groups. One is African-American or Caribbean-American men. Do you know where the number one highest incidence of prostate cancer in the world is? Any guesses? Africa. No. It probably would be if they screened for it, but they don't screen a lot. But it's in Trinidad and Tobago, the, the Caribbean island of Tobago. So I was part of an NIH grant several years ago where we went to Tobago. It was actually a great grant because I got to spend the week in Tobago, which is beautiful. And we taught them how to do prostatectomies. And I, I think I did 27 prostatectomies in a week over there. And it was beautiful. The, the operating room is open to the Caribbean. There's, it's a beautiful place. But they are the number one uh, incidence of prostate cancer in the world. So in any case, African-American, Caribbean-American men is certainly one high-risk group. And, and number two is men with a family history. If you have a first-degree relative with prostate cancer, 
you are considered a high risk group. So clearly those individuals should be done, should be screened. Secondly, the increased utilization of active surveillance. So in my practice, I will tell you right now, about 28% of men I see with prostate cancer, I put on active surveillance. So my surgical volume is down by about 25%. And so we are now really looking at patients. We know we don't need to treat everyone. There's plenty of men who have very low volume, low risk disease, and they can be watched. The number one reason for failure on active surveillance is anxiety. It's not progression of disease. So assuming people can, can handle the anxiety of having a cancer and not treating it, active surveillance is often a very reasonable approach to these patients. And what's your protocol for active surveillance? So we get MRIs on everybody, um, and I'll what, show you. What? Oh, you're going to talk I'll show you some data on that in a moment. Um, and we see patients every six months. Uh, we do a rectal exam and a PSA. They get an MRI every year. And most men will have a confirmatory biopsy at one year after their initial diagnosis. And if that's consistent, then we just follow them with MRIs and PSAs. Oh, no more biopsies right. annually? Right. Unless I, there's a for-cause reason. Yeah. Is, is that unique to the way you, you practice? No, I think that's become fairly standard nationwide now. Yeah, the, uh, there are, uh, confidence in MRIs have improved dramatically, so we, we depend on them a lot more than we had in the past. You talked about the pelvic MRI. Uh, yes, a 3T multiparametric MRI. And second, uh, what extended his question, what are your criteria after you did a biopsy? How often you will repeat? Right, so we repeat a biopsy at a year. No, just one time at, at the year mark from their initial biopsy. And then after that, we don't do biopsies every year. It's just too much to do a biopsy on a patient every single year. You know, if you have a guy who comes in who's 52, you know, you're going to follow him until he's 80, you can wind up doing 30 biopsies on a patient. You might as well do a prostatectomy. But I think that we now have greater reliance and confidence in MRIs. And so the, the likelihood of you harboring a significant prostate cancer in the presence of a normal MRI is very low, close to zero. So if you have an, M if you have an MRI that does not show any suspicious lesions, the chance of you having a significant cancer in there is close to zero. So when are they gonna do away with biopsies? biopsies completely? It's a good question. You know, I don't think we're at that point yet, but I think I'm not going to talk about some of this data, but we are now really moving in the direction of what's called molecular biopsies, meaning we're getting these specialized PSMA scans. So PSMA stands for prostate-specific membrane antigen, and we're improving these, what's called a PET MRI fusion scan. We're actually looking metabolically within the prostate and seeing what's in there. And so I think ultimately we may have that. We're not there yet, but that's not not inconceivable to me that we will have non-invasive biopsies. That would be a big step. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So the other thing is, um, I think, improved diagnosis of significant cancers with avoiding overdiagnosis of, of indolent cancers. And this is precisely where MRI comes into play, is we're able to distinguish many times between significant and insignificant cancers. And then finally, you know, I think improving on surgery. I mean, surgery is definitely indicated in a significant subset of men with significant prostate cancers. And if we could develop a surgery where side effects are not significant or less significant, then I think it'd be more, more amenable to offer that to patients on a regular basis. Do you do the robotic? Yes, I, I do 99% of my cases now are done robotically. But, but you see in today's day, doing a prostatectomy and still there is risks of side effects. Absolutely. I tell every single patient you're never going to be the same after a prostatectomy. That doesn't mean you can't live a great quality of life and have normal sexual and urinary function, but it's different. And you're never the same. You're brought into this earth one way, but after a prostatectomy you will be different. I don't want to spend too much time on side effects, that's a whole other discussion, but yes, you're 100% right. What about in between? Uh, radio, uh, radiation and seeds and all that stuff? 
I mean, you know, there's, I think the discussion of how to treat cancer is, is a intricate one. And I think there's a role for radiation. I think we're certainly seeing less radioactive seed in plants now than we did a decade ago for a variety of different reasons. One, they're probably not quite as effective as we thought they would. But more, more importantly, the, the, the optimal patient for seed in plants were patients with a tiny focus of Gleason 6 cancer. And now we just don't treat those patients at all. So I think the patients that were getting seed implantations, we now have an active surveillance. So I think that's probably the main reason why that paradigm has changed. Radiation still exists. I think something called IGRT or image guided radiotherapy is sort of the standard of care that's often combined with hormone treatments, depending upon the risk category that you're in. And then of course there's the cyber knife therapy that most people have heard of, which is a consolidated form of radiation therapy. Um, so radiation still has a role for sure. So I think, you know, the medical community responds by altering uh, screening programs, the urologic community responds in address to that by altering treatment patterns. So it's, it's you really see how far reaching these U.S. government sort of interventions have. Is low risk just a Gleason 6? Yeah, low risk is pretty that? much a, a PSA less than 10, low volume Gleason 6 prostate cancer. So what we see here now is that the percent of patients um, who are, let me see if I understand. That. Oh yeah, okay, this is the frequency of patients who are having surgery with Gleason 6 disease. So you see less and less patients now with Gleason 6 disease are having surgery. And what's also happening is if we look here, you know, initially anyone on active surveillance, a lot of them, 50% of them were failing and going on to surgery predominantly because of anxiety. But now as, as consumers or patients, are used to this active surveillance program, less and less patients are leaving active surveillance for surgery. So I think not only have the doctors gotten the message, but patients are getting the message as well that we don't need to treat every single prostate cancer. And this is, happens in, in age groups as well. So if you look up top, you know, younger men were, were treating less and less prostate cancer, and older men were treating the more aggressive kinds. So again, we're tailoring the disease to the individual and to the type of cancer that they have, telling the treatment, I should say. Um, so now if we look at surgery, I, I just wanna talk a little bit now of the evolution of surgery as, as it relates to some of this stuff. So, you know, prostatectomy, believe it or not, was first described in 1903 by one of the most famous urologists named Hugh Hampton Young. He was at Hopkins. He's sort of the, considered the father of urology. Um, and the first retropubic prostatectomy was done in 47, but it really wasn't until the 80s and Pat Walsh described the nerve anatomy and how he could spare nerves to maintain sexual function that prostatectomy really became a mainstay of treatment for prostate cancer. And then in Europe, the French doctors, Dr. Valencien and Guillenot, and Guillenot was actually here in New York for about eight, eight years or so, but now it's back in France, they were the first to begin to do laparoscopic prostate surgery. And then Manny Menon and the group in Detroit back in 2000 were the first to first describe robotic surgery for prostate cancer. And what's really interesting, if you look back in 2004, so just to give you an indication, I started doing robotic prostate surgery in 2002. So in 2004, about 8% of all prostate surgery was done robotically, okay? Now let's fast forward to 2014, over 90%, and this is, this is old data now. 2017, it's close to 100%. So, you know, very few prostatectomies now are being done open. And what we're seeing in Europe, Europe's about a decade behind us. You know, Europe is about where we were in 2005. So probably 40% of prostates in Europe are done robotically. So this is precisely why intuitive surgical is focusing far less in the US right now and focusing in Europe because there's much greater potential for market growth than here in the US, but that's beside the point. So it's an interesting snapshot. And if you look at all your robotic surgery and urology, you know, the blue is prostate. So we've seen prostate peaked in about 2011. And because of after surveillance, we're seeing a drop off, but we're seeing increase in robotic kidney surgery and robotic bladder surgery. So robotic surgery has really become a cornerstone for much of urologic oncology surgery. Um, 
So there are a few trials that looked at, you know, is surgery better than active surveillance? You know, so this, or radiation for that matter. So there are three trials I want to focus on because you may hear about some of these trials. Some of them have been published in the New York Times and the lay literature. And I think they're, they're very common studies, okay? One is called, and they're all listed right here. We have something called the PIVOT trial, which stands for prostate cancer Interve intervention versus observation. Okay, we have the SPCG study four trial, which is a European arm. And we have what's called the PROTECT trial. Okay, and these are three trials that have all been published. And I want to just briefly touch upon them because I think they're important trials. So the PIVOT trial, again, is comparing intervention, whether it be radiation or surgery, compared to observation, meaning just active surveillance. And it was 731 patients. They were all VA patients or government-sponsored NIH patients. Okay, it was supposed to be a study of 2,000 men, but they stopped the trial after 731. Um, it was generally, because it was a VA population, they tended to be a slightly unhealthier cohort than average patients. Um, so that may be, in fact, there was a five times greater mortality in this group than we see in the general population. But basically what they found that this favored surgery as compared to uh, observation. That if you look at prostate cancer death rate, it was about twice the death rate in those men that were observed versus those who had their prostates removed. So this PIVOT trial, in fact, favored treatment. A second trial called the SBGC4, this is a European or Scan the Scandinavians, by the way, the Swedes, Finlands, they're very commonly ob observing patients. It's a massive population. It's very homogeneous. They don't tend to travel everywhere to get their care. So it's a really nice population to study as it relates to some of this stuff. And so they randomized about 700 men to either surgery or active surveillance. And again, just to cut to the chase, they found a significant reduction in metastatic disease or treatment of metastatic disease in those individuals that had surgery as compared to uh, active surveillance or, or watchful waiting. And finally, the PROTECT trial. This was a trial that compared surgery and radiation compared to active monitoring. In this one, they found that there was no difference in prostate cancer death rate between any of the treatment arms, meaning observing patients was just as good as treating them. But what this excluded, and this is important, they, they excluded men in high-risk disease. So yes, I would agree, in men with low risk disease, and th these are the men we put on active surveillance, there's probably no difference in treating them or operating on them, but in high risk disease there is. And so the take home messages of these trials, again, supports our practice patterns that men who have high risk disease should be treated and, and not observed. Yes? The first two trials, were they all no, they were a variety of different, none of these trials were all Gleason 6s, but they were risk stratified. The last trial I showed in this one excluded high risk patients. The other two trials had both low and high risk patients. What's considered high risk? High risk is Gleason 8, 9s, and 10s. Okay. Um, so finally, or not finally, but in terms of robot versus open prostate surgery, how am I doing for time? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, so these were two, a meta-analysis, meta for those of you who don't know, is an analysis where you take multiple studies in the literature and you take, combine them into one study and compare the results. And basically there have been two trials that looked at robot surgery versus open surgery and found that robotic surgery offers improved urinary control and potency at one year as compared to open surgery. And there was a single center randomized trial that basically showed that um, you know, blood loss and length of stay, of course, of course, were shorter, but they found no differences in margin rates or in urinary control, sexual function. So, again, I always tell people it's far more important who does your surgery than how it's done. And so you can still get a great job open and you can get a great job robotically, but frankly, the, the reverse can happen as well. So I think in the right hands, it doesn't matter how it's done. So I think you, it's more important to be comfortable with your surgeon and that he's comfortable with his technique or her technique as compared to just demanding one way or the other. Um, so I want to touch upon a few things that I do to help optimize surgical outcomes. And the first thing I want to talk about, and these are the three things I'm going to talk about, and we'll get, we're going to talk a little about the MRI, I'm going to talk about something called site-specific labeling, and the rectal exam, the DRE. 
So what site-specific labeling does, you know, when you have a biopsy, I'm sure many people have, in this room have had biopsies, but you take about 14 or 16 of these cores and then you see what has cancer in it. But it's really important to know where in the prostate the cancer is located. Because what I do during surgery, I develop this visual, visual roadmap that at the time of surgery, I want to know exactly where the cancer was located. Does that correlate with the MRI abnormalities that we'll talk about? And does that correlate when there's any firmness on the rectal exam? Because what you find, if you just take every single patient and say, okay, you have prostate cancer, I'm going to take out your prostate and ignore everything else, you will leave cancer behind in about 40% of men. Whereas if you all of a sudden integrate where the cancer is located, the MRI findings and the rectal exam, you could drop that down to about 3%. So you see, simply by knowing this information translates into massive differences after surgery. So it's important to demand of your surgeon to pay attention to these elements because these really translate to very, very impactful findings. And so here's how it happens. If you look at the percent of, of side-specific cores with tumor, they, it can predict what's called neurovascular bundle penetration. So if you have two cores, say on the right apex and the right mid that are next to one another, the chance of you having extension into the nerve bundle at that point is much higher. So you're either gonna go a little wider, or what I do, I take frozen section biopsies in that location. I have a pathologist tell me while we're there, is there cancer or no cancer? So understanding the location of these, whether they're in juxtaposition with one another, these are all Seem, they seem sort of common and, and inane, but they're really, really important things to do. How long does the frozen sample take for the pathologist? 10 minutes or so. Yeah, 10 minutes they get it back to us. Well, yes. When you have a patient doc that has half of the prostate diagnosed with cancer and the other half does not, and you, you, know, you read the report, cuts it in half, right? Right. I'm sorry, say that again? When you see it where, they, where, where the where positive cores are only on one side? Yes, sir. So the answer is I've had a lot of patients request that, uh -huh. but it's not possible to remove half a prostate. But what they would be a candidate for, which is a treatment algorithm I didn't really go through today, is something called focal therapy. And that's a rapidly growing arm of prostate cancer treatment where you could use either something called HIFU, which stands for high intensity focused ultrasound. You could use cryotherapy where you freeze the prostate or RFA, it's called radiofrequency ablation, or now there's even some laser therapies to ablate tumors. So focal therapy is growing as a treatment algorithm for patients that have focal disease. So yes, that, it's not possible to remove half the prostate, but you could focally ablate half the prostate. Therefore, uh, reducing the risk of that neurovascular. Exactly right, right. But what, what percentage of prostate cancer is multifocal? The vast majority is multifocal, but it could be multifocal within one side of the prostate. It doesn't necessarily have to be bilateral, meaning on both sides of the prostate. You know, unfortunately, still a good amount of prostate cancer is on both sides of the prostate. So one of the ways we're beginning to use these PSMA scans is someone who we're considering for focal therapy that we think may have isolated disease, we can get a PSMA scan on them, and if it doesn't light up anywhere in the prostate, then yes, they may have microscopic evidence of Gleason 6 disease there, but so what? But we just want to make sure they don't have Gleason 7, 8, 9 disease anywhere else. And so I think that's where focal, what, what's really holding focal therapy back right now is good imaging modalities. So as these PET scans and PSMA scans improve and MRIs improve, I think focal therapy will grow even further. The distance of the nerve to the prostate is about one to two millimeters. I mean, it's not like 10 feet away. So one of the major advantages of robotic surgery is that everything's magnified 12 fold. So it helps me appreciate and, and navigate that plane with much greater precision than I could do with the naked eye. And that's, to me, that robotics is all about visualization, right? You're in a bloodless field that's magnified and it helps, you know, prostate cancer, I always tell people is a disease of subtleties. It's not a disease of black and white massive differences, but understanding these subtleties and navigating through these subtleties translates into massive differences down the road. 
So this can make the difference between a PSA recurrence or a non-PSA recurrence, or erections or no erections, right? I mean, there's millimeters dictates these differences. So it's important to pay attention to these details as a physician because they really translate into really unbelievable changes down the road. The other thing we talk about is, you know, nerve sparing is not an all or none response, right? You, you, you could do degrees of nerve sparing. So when someone asked me, did we spare the nerves? Sometimes I could safely say, yes, we did a perfect nerve sparing, got right on the capsule. But sometimes in guys with more advanced disease, I could do levels of nerve sparing. I want to touch a little bit upon that. So if you look at, at the upper left there in A, that's complete nerve sparing. You see there's really nothing left on the prostate capsule. Okay, it's clean. Here now, here's the capsule. You can see there's a little stuff left over there. And then here, there's, a, there's arteries and everything. So this is a non-nerve sparing. You can see the whole nerve, neurovascular. It's called a neurovascular bundle because it has nerves, arteries, and veins. Okay, so you can see there's arteries, veins, and nerves in this. Here there's a little bit, but not as much as that one. So you can see you can do varying degrees of nerve sparing to really optimize the chance of getting all the cancer out while minimizing any impact on, on sexual function. And these are the degrees of nerve sparings that we talk about. And so, uh, you know, a level one is where you get right onto the capsule. So when a guy who has no evidence of his, M of his, on his MRI of extension into the capsule has localized disease, I always try to do the best nerve sparing I can, get right onto the capsule. But again, sometimes I adjust that based upon the individual's disease. So as you can see, it's not a black and white issue. It's really, you know, finely tuned into that individual's cancer, how close or far we need to be from the capsule of the prostate. What percentage of patients do you see have the bulge or the extension? So I would say over the last five years, a much, much higher rate of that. I, I'm definitely seeing more advanced disease now. Now, whether that's a manifestation of later PSA screening and they're presenting at a later state or disease migration or just the nature of my practice, I don't know. But I'm definitely seeing more advanced disease now than I did a decade ago. So that puts the patient at a higher risk for what you're describing? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. But is it because patients are referred to you at, at this I think it's probably a combination of patients referred to me. You know, I, I'm not like a prostatectomist. So there are some people in New York that they're prostatectomists. They're not, I'm a urologic oncologist. So I get referred patients probably with more complex disease, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, I don't know. I think there's, it's a multitude of reasons, I think, why that's occurring. And I think just the nature of prostate cancer has changed. I think a lot of men are either not getting screened or they're getting screened at a point where the disease is a bit more advanced. So I, I definitely partly is that. So finally, I want to talk about, we, this, this is how we optimize sexual function. But how do we optimize urinary control, right? Urinary control is another big element to this. And I think first and foremost, we want to minimize any damage that occurs to the bladder neck. That's where the prostate was attached to. We obviously want to avoid injury to the sphincter and its nerve supply, but ultimately we, once the prostate's out, you want to restore these structures to give the proper support. And then finally, when we, when we suture the bladder back to the urethra, that has to be watertight because any leakage of urine through that area can set you up for scar tissue and, and, and problems with what's called the anastomosis. So I want to touch on some of these. So bladder neck is again the area that's, so the, the prostate's attached to two points. One's the bladder and one's the urethra. So the bladder neck is where it gets attached to the bladder. And we found the bladder neck preservation results in better early continence rates, but probably doesn't have any impact on 12 or 24 rates. Um, but wait, I think- Wait, 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 doesn't it have any impact on what? So meaning at one year data- Oh, that's 12 or 24. You okay. could, by sparing the bladder neck, you'll have er, better early continence, but at 12, at Beyond 12 months, it's not going to impact it in any way. Um, and, but it will show that there's less bladder neck contractures. That means scar tissue where the two form. Some men after a prostatectomy all of a sudden notice they're having trouble urinating or they begin to leak urine all of a sudden. That could be the sign that some scar tissue develops there and that needs to be opened up. Um, the uh, avoiding injury to the sphincter, that sort of goes without saying, um, but it's, it's not overly intuitive. I mean. 
the sphincteric muscles, I'm not going to get into too much of this, this is just a cadaver study, but basically here's the bladder, here's the prostate, the urethra is over here, and there's pudendal nerves that come in again, which are very small, so it's important to minimize not only physical injury to these nerves, but traction injury as well. And so this is one of the most important things. So what I do, years ago, I used to just sew the bladder back to the urethra. That's it. And at 12-year data, still uh, over 90% of the men were totally dry. But at six-week data, many, many, many men were still leaking. So what I do now is what's called total urethral reconstruction. And so there's a layer underneath the bladder and prostate called the rectourethralis. So I first reconstruct that muscle, then I sew the bladder back to the urethra, and then there's a third layer up top that we reconstruct. And what I found that by doing three layer reconstructions, the vast majority of the men by six weeks are dry. And so it's really, it hasn't altered 12 month data, but it's pushed it back. And being dry early on, I think is a, is a big benefit. And then of course, getting a watertight anastomosis. Sometimes we use barbed sutures these are sutures that have little quills or hooks on them. So when you throw it through, it doesn't loosen up as you're tying it. And that may have some benefit suturing. Um, the compression, I'm not gonna get too much into that. This is into the physics, but basically this is the physics behind what I was just describing to you. So I think in conclusion, I just wanna say is PSA screening as we spoke about is important. Surgery still has an important role of treatment but techniques, very small techniques, can have big impacts on surgical treatment of prostate cancer. And I always say, I tell this to the residents, every job is a portrait of the person who did it. So it's always important to autograph your work with excellence. And I think that's the take home message of this. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you develop uh, any of these uh, yeah, I mean, there's the reconstruction aspect. There's something called a Rocco stitch. Rocco is a urologist in Italy who first described doing that posterior reconstruction. But I've altered that now into a three-layer component. And that's something I've devised on my own. But yeah, there's all kinds of modifications that people have done Did on. You publish it? I haven't published that yet. We probably will publish it at some point. Um, but it's a uh, it's clearly making a huge difference without question. I noticed that, I'm European, I'm, I was born in Italy, and I noticed that all the people I talk to in Europe, they take a much, much more casual way of, for the PSA, or, uh, you know, on, on how to, to treat. Sure. I mean, yeah, I, mean you're, I don't know why, I mean, it's a, Well, I think, you know, in Europe, and it, it's somewhat regional, so I can't categorize all of Europe as one, but certainly Northern Europe, treatment for prostate cancer is not common. It's far more common to go on active surveillance or what we call watchful waiting, where you don't even check things. Um, Southern Europe's a little different. You know, certainly Germany, prostate cancer treatment is, is all over the place, like the US, parts of France, it's like that. Italy, I would say, Central and Southern Italy, treatment's a bit more common than Northern Italy. Once you get into Northern Italy and Austria, it becomes a little less common, we see more active surveillance. So it's somewhat regional in that regard. And that's precisely why you look at robotic utilization. I think the Europeans are a bit more cost conscious than the Americans are. So robotics has been less pervasive in Europe than it is here. Um, things are changing. Uh, an ex-partner of mine, he's probably spoken at some of these, Chirac Chariot, no? So Chirac was a, um, he was a fellow at Memorial a few years back and then was on faculty here with me at Cornell and then he's Austrian. and. He moved back home to become chairman in Vienna, and so he's obviously American trained. And uh, but I, I would say the you know it's interesting, the Journal of Urology, which is the American top urology journal, used to be the number one what we call impact factor journal in urology, but now it's become European Urology. So European Urology, which is the European version of that, is a higher impact factor than the American Journal of Urology. So the Europeans are really beginning to take off right now. Um, the English in, in England are very, very, very big on focal therapy. Focal therapy is far more common in Europe than in the US. For the large part, is it's only been recently FDA approved here in the US. It's been approved in Europe for a long time. What, what is focal? Focal therapy is where you just treat one part of the prostate and not the whole prostate. 
and there's a variety of different energy sources you could choose from, you know, laser energy, freezing it, burning it, ultrasound therapy, HIFU. But HIFU in England, for example, is, is probably the most common form of treatment. Cyberknife is, is, no, Cyberknife is simply radiation. It's delivering the same dose of radiation just in focused, concentrated doses. So you only get five sessions instead of 45 sessions. So whether, again, whether that's going to stand the test of time with long-term data, I just don't know yet. So that Cyberknife treats the whole prostate Treats the whole prostate, well. right. right. Percentage of recurrences on so it really, you know, again, it's, you have to talk in terms of stage and grade and, sure. and PSAs and all that. So everyone's very different. You know, obviously a guy, you know, and, and all this data is based on what are called nomograms. So Peter Scardino has, has published a huge amount of nomograms. Uh, Peter Carroll at UCSF, um, uh, Alan Parton at Hopkins, they've all dedicated their careers on making these predictive models. So a recurrent, well again, in part it depends on a few factors. So when did the PSA start recurring and the velocity of the PSA rise? So a few scenarios, if, if you had an undetectable PSA and it's seven years, you're beginning to see a slow rise and you had positive margins at the time of your surgery, then I think what's called salvage radiation therapy would be a reasonable option. Um, and now that's often combined with one dose of hormone treatments. If you have a rapidly rising PSA where the doubling time is three months or so, then, you know, I think the likelihood is there could be disease outside the prostate area and radiation may not be beneficial in that scenario. So the PSA velocity post-surgical is a very good parameter to look at. Yeah. Doctor, I have a, I have a friend who's 66 and, I, you know, I was discussing my, my own experience with, with, with the surgery, which was very positive. And so I asked him, I asked him when his PSA score was, and he said his doctor never administered PSA because he doesn't believe in it. This is uh, before, he hasn't been diagnosed with anything, it's before hasn't treatment. He hasn't been diagnosed with anything, he's 66 years old, he's never had a PSA test. I mean, what would you yeah, tell him? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, that's, we're seeing more and more of that, yeah. you know, with the U.S. Preventative Task Force coming against it. It's unfortunate, but, you know, look, I think he's in his 60s, if he's otherwise healthy, I think you should have a PSA done. I mean, look, I always tell people, if you want to not treat your prostate cancer, that's fine, but at least go in with, with a full deck of information. You know, the, to me, information is king. And understanding, you know, if your PS, you, no one ever died from a PSA. So get a PSA done. If you decide you don't want to act on it, that's fine. But if all of a sudden your PSA comes back as 280, then you may want to think about doing yeah. something about it, you know? Well, you know, PSA, when it's less than 0.1, is not entirely reliable. I can get a PSA on the same person in the same day, and you can see some of those fluctuations. So, you know, I, I think you need more trends on that line. So if, if your PSA went from 0.05 to 0.1 to 0.3 to 0.6 to 1 point, that's a rapidly rising PSA. The issue is we, PSA can detect things postoperatively far before any imaging can. So oftentimes we see p patients who come in with a PSA of 0.8 and they have negative bone scans, negative CAT scans, negative PET scans, and you know, what do you do with those patients? It's a tough, tough problem. You know, I, I think it's important to balance treatment with the patient. And so, as I said, no one dies of an elevated PSA, but it's a matter of what, it, what the connotations of that are and the implications of it are. And so I think you need to follow patients closely. But so for example, if he's already failed radiation and hormones, if his PSA is not rapidly rising, I'd probably just yeah, watch him. Okay, so you know he still has an option of getting hormone treatments, but well, no yeah. one wants to get hormones if they don't need it. Yeah, I mean, you know, look, if you look at all comers and most of the large surgical data sets, about a third of patients will have a PSA recurrence over the course of their lifetime. So it's not terribly uncommon. Not all of those will require treatment for it, but it's not uncommon. Why is that recurrence rate so high? You know, I think prostate cancer probably in some individuals is metastatic at the time of diagnosis and we just can't find it. Um, but what about te newer tests uh, with genomics and uh, Well, the, all these, biopsies? yeah, genomic testings are non, di they're not diagnostic tests, they're tests that give you an association of your cancer with right. prognosis. But, 
you know, short of PSA, we don't have really any other tests right now to look at. But PSA is a good marker after a treatment. It's not a good marker well, what before about treatment. Circulating tumor cells. That that's something that's coming of age right now. Again, where we can detect what are what are called CTCs. These are circulating tumor cells and that may ultimately become a new biomarker in replace of PSA or adjunctive to it, but it's not ready for prime time.